you know, I, I have to applaud the, the developers that are that are doing things right from the beginning because you know it's that much easier to, to build appropriately from the beginning than than what the majority of my work is, and that's towards retrofitting. You know, we have we have a lot of large roads out there, and and so um, not just from a, a bicycling standpoint, but but from a pedestrian uh, connectivity and safety. Aloha, everyone. Ikomo mai. Welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that is Mike Packard from SSFM in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we are going to be talking about some of the exciting things happening in the state of Hawaii, uh, my previous hometown of Honolulu, and also a little bit about the big island of Hawaii. Uh, it's really, really fun, and it's great to sort of remember my time living in the islands, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's get right to it with Mike Packard. Mike Packard, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Hey, thanks a lot for having me, John. Uh, happy to be here. So uh, why don't you do this? Why don't you just uh, take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Mike Packard. I am a traffic engineer by uh, by signature, um, but really I wear many hats. I work for a planning engineering company based out of Honolulu called SSFM. Um, and I've been in Hawaii a little bit over 15 years now. Oh, fantastic. That, that was going to be one of my questions is, is how long have you been in Hawaii? Uh, that's fantastic. So what prompted that move uh, to Hawaii for you? Yeah, it's funny. I like to say that I, uh, I crossed paths with uh, Obama. Um, I, I actually am from Washington, D.C. originally, okay. uh, born and raised, uh, you know, grew up on Capitol Hill, went to uh, Washington, D.C. public schools. Um, that's where I went, met my uh, now wife. Uh, we moved to Chicago for, for a bit as she was doing her schooling. And as we got out, of, uh, she finished up school there. Um, we, we found some amazing opportunities in Honolulu and, and made the move. And, uh, you know, it's been history since then. Fantastic. That's great. So about 15 years. So what year was, was that about? Yeah, it was about 2009, 2008, 2009. So it was actually around the, the, the global, uh, <laughs> the global economy was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was, I point. was there a little bit before you. So I, I, I made the move to Honolulu. Um, I think it was the fall of 2004. And then by 2008, 2009, I was already over on the big Island, but I did start out there in, in Honolulu, in, in Oahu, which is on the Island of Oahu, which is where you're at there. And, uh, I, I suppose I should have kicked this off by saying aloha. Yeah, aloha. <laughs> and we're both wearing our Sig Zane shirts, which um, we have to give uh, the, this designer, Sig Zane, a little bit of love here. Uh, a fabulous designer there in Hilo, Hawaii. And, uh, you know, it's it's rare that I get an opportunity to wear my aloha shirts. So I, I, I'm glad you gave me that opportunity, Mike. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, thank you, too. And I, and I do need to celebrate that because as I moved my, my work from Washington, D.C. to Chicago to here, it, things just became more and more relaxed. I lost the suit jacket <laughs> then I lost the tie. And then all of a sudden, all those white button up shirts, they were gone. Yeah, and frankly, were. I, I did this just for you, John, but but I buttoned this last button. I would not normally <laughs> have this. It's almost too uptight for me right now, but yeah, you know, I yeah. thought it'd be a little more professional for, for <laughs> the na national audience. I, I, I appreciate it. international, in fact, uh, international audience. And, and in fact, let's uh, let's pop on over to the uh, the, the website, too, with uh, for for the organization. Uh, so did you actually go to work for SS uh, FM right away uh, when you first moved over or was that a, a gradual um, uh, a change? You know, it's, it was interesting The you know, the. The, my boss that, that hired me, Cheryl Soon, was a former um, city and county uh, transportation director as well as the state DOT director. She, at the time, had just started up with SSFM, and she hired me straight from Chicago um, without a traffic transportation program at the company. She, she, you know, just in her experience, having done that work, she identified the need for, for some more transportation engineers with, with, a, with a more of a progressive look towards things. And so... You know, that was, it was an amazing opportunity for me. And, and, you know, I've been with the company now 
you know, just under that 15 years because I, I did take a, take a small break within this, this past 15 year period. And, and I worked at the city and county for a little over a year, which, which, you know, in the grand scheme of things is helping to move that in that same direction that, you know, that I, that I have really been working on, uh, over, over my career, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And specifically, you know, you just mentioned something there that sort of alluded to the fact that you're not just like any other transportation engineer. What do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I, I like to consider myself a plan engineer, and and depending on the uh, audience I'm with, I'd be careful about um, admitting to being a traffic engineer because you know there th- that comes with a lot of baggage, and and realistically, overcoming that historical, you know, the the the, the ways that we've we've been doing things not to a to a degree that that, that can support a livable community and, and really you know overcoming some of those those trends and 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 past past errors and so I, I do pride myself and and you know continue to work both as you know somewhat of an advocate in my in my way and that is for for good pedestrian and, and bicycle design and so the majority of, of my work that I that I seek and, and that that I that I really celebrate is around the idea of, of complete streets, vision zero, and and livable active streets. You know, I, I, I support that concept and, and in that niche, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to to provide that. And so, you know, I, I like to think that that I am one of the, the different ones, one of the the ones that is helping to move that that paradigm shift forward. And, and that's, that's been a big part of my work here over the past you know, decade, really, is, is trying to help that paradigm shift throughout the state, um, really just helping to, to change the minds and, and ways that we do things here from an engineering standpoint, but also in a scoping and, and an outreach and uh, just community engagement, trying yeah. to be more equitable um, and, and inclusive to, to make sure that we can help bring everyone with us and, and provide that context of a, of a livable place for, for everyone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned complete streets. And of course, back in uh, 2013, about a decade ago, um, you know, complete streets started to hit the radar screen. Uh, I was still living in Hawaii um, in in 2013 when this was happening. And I recognize a few of those faces in this photo. Talk a little bit about that context of, you know, coming along and 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 being able to starting to embrace this concept of maybe streets should be for something more than just prioritizing the movement of automobiles yeah and so around 2012 the the city and county of honolulu passed what's called the complete streets ordinance and and that you know really set that that requirement that that all work that we do um, within the, the public right of way, you know, considers the the interests and needs of all users, and you know, while while ordinances and, and laws are are not required to make these types of shifts, it, it, it has proved to be extremely helpful here, and and really that was the start of, of what has has been over the past decade a, a move um, it, it, that paradigm shift move towards doing all things. Um, with a more context sensitive, uh, complete streets, principle based, you know, a- approach, you know, those, um, the Helion complete streets demonstration event was, was just that it was a, it was a closed street event, you know, based around the, the concepts of the cyclovias. But in, on top of that, we, we worked out with the city, the opportunity to show a bit of a quick build idea, what bulb outs with landscaping more active and, and welcoming streets. And so, you know, we, we presented and, and worked with the community and the politicians to, to get the support and, and really celebrate what could be. And this was in a, a community that's, that's called Kakako. And um, at the time it was, it was largely industrial, you know, low volume, low density buildings. And, and it is what's being turned into now a, a very high density downtown city where, where a lot of these ideas have been realized, um, you know, not, not too, too unlike Austin, you know, the, the development and, and the high rise and just the urbanization of, of our cities has really, you know, started around these ideas. And, and at that point we were trying to get ahead of it and, and show and 
support what was what was possible to to not just bring um, the cars with the density to really move that mindset um, both from the developers but from the politicians and the community to to try and have this this greater appreciation as to what was possible yeah and I see that this is a, an event that took place back in uh, 2013 in May. And and really, like you said, it, describing it as like a, a, a bit of a cyclovia, really trying to r- change. You know, I like to a phrase, you know, that oftentimes this is an opportunity for us to redefine what streets are for and help the community along with this. Uh, because, you know, quite frankly, and a lot of people don't realize this is in, and I didn't realize this really when I made the move from Boulder, Colorado, uh, to, to Honolulu in, in 2004, 2005, I, I, I was just like, I was stoked. I mean, I landed a really cool job. I was going to be there on Island. Uh, you know, I packed up my bike and I was I, actually, I was an Ironman distance triathlon at that time. So I was entered into Ironman Canada. I was going to be training for the event and I'd be swimming and, and training and running and everything. I get there and I'm just like, well, holy moly, this is just really, really rough to be running and biking on these streets. It's the historical context of what it was, what it felt like was, it felt like this. It felt like King Street in 1954. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really it really did. And, you know, if you were to change out those cars with with a, with a street full of Tacomas, um, that, that's not too different from from what we see today. It's a it's a very congested car forward community society. It, it's you know, it's a product of the, the post World War Two um, development uh, pattern. It, it looks like a, a lot of Midwest cities that were built in around that suburban mindset at the time, you know, King street as shown here was, was one of those that predated that, that era and, and, you know, was built around the streetcar and had these streetcar transit oriented development type of communities. And, and unfortunately that was, that was abandoned um, soon thereafter. And, and that's when suburbanization and sprawl really took forward and, and, and has caused a lot of the, the degradation to, to, to livability and really just traveling. It, it is, it's a congested city um, if you choose to get where you're going by, by car. <laughs> I, 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 too, when, when moving here from, from Chicago, uh, was, was shocked about the difficulty in, in cycling. And, and I thought uh, my experience in Biking in downtown Chicago and downtown DC, you know, prior to the, to the era of of bike lanes and, and and protected cycle tracks, I thought that I had seen it all. But but Hawaii really it was a it was a difficult place to to ride, and and I really do think we've made a lot of um, progress over over the past 10, 15 years. But but we also still have a lot of ways to, a lot of ways to go. Yeah. And the other picture from uh, 1954 that you sent along is is basically the same street, but at a different angle and a different part of of this is, you know, the fact that, yes, we have this mashup of lots of people, pedestrians, lots of people on the street at the same time of having all of these motor vehicles. And right about the time when the complete streets ordinance was signed in, in 2012, you know, Hawaii was noted as being the highest pedestrian fatality rate uh, per capita of any city in the United States. I mean, it is not a very flattering uh, reality of being uh, somebody who's walking or biking uh, in the state of Hawaii. Yeah, it, it, it really, um, you know, those those points have not been been really taken to heart enough, in, in my opinion. And this is one of those pieces where uh, advocates and and legislators really need to, you know, in my opinion, that's that's a big piece of this. The understanding the context of, of where we live and and how our daily habits contribute to this, and so. You know, I, I love this this photo of, of the you know what appears to be an all way crossing, a barns dance, because we have quite a few of those in Waikiki, where we have you know, our, our primary tourist you know based economy, but at the same time, thousands of people crossing the street in these in these hours. You know, this is not too too dissimilar to what our downtown 
used to be like. You know, I would say that, that we're slowly getting back there in the way that we, we treat mobility. But yeah, we there we were we had dug ourselves into quite a hole, and it's a it's a disproportionately unfortunate that that it, it, it's taken its higher toll on on the elderly and and our indigenous uh, population. Uh, Native Hawaiians are at greater risk of being killed while while walking or or on bikes. And, and you know, some of these things have, have come out of some of the more recent Vision Zero reports, both here in Honolulu and, and on Hawaii Island, where, where you were. And, you know, that's, that is a, a really uh, sad and correctable action. You know, this is something that, that to me is, is reason enough to, to pursue some of these, these changes and, 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 you know, just to improve life for, for everyone. Yeah, so for your, for your listeners who are more used to... <laughs> The, the Hawaii, uh, Oahu, this is what they think of. Yeah, this is, this is probably, uh, you know, one of our more well-known uh, street contacts. And even if you're looking at this, you know, unfortunately, you got your, your McDonald's right there. And, and to the left, you can't see. But, you know, uh, across the street is, is the, the beautiful Pacific Ocean. Um, you can see a one-way bike lane there. That's all-way uh, pedestrian crossing. But what you might not be able to pick up on is you know, three lanes of traffic, three lanes of one-way traffic. I mean, this is fronting um, what is some of the most beautiful sand and, and ocean in the world, where people come from across the world to, to visit Hawaii. And when they think of Hawaii, Honolulu, Waikiki, this, this is really what they see. And, and I would suggest that, that this prioritization of, of vehicular movement is, is not necessarily what you know, what we should be, be trying to, uh, you know, get across to our visitors. You know, they come here with the ability to, to walk and, and this concept of what paradise could be. I don't think anyone has ever described paradise as, you know, sitting in their car surrounded by congestion on a 10-lane freeway, which is you know, only about a mile from here. And, and we get that, that occasion daily, multiple times daily, frankly. So, there, there, it's a it's a big shift that needs to come to to make this distinction between uh, what's possible here from uh, to increase livability. Yeah. Well, and I like to tell people too that you know a part of the active town's origin story is in fact because of my time uh, there in uh, on Oahu and in Honolulu uh, because it was such a shock to my system of not being able to be in. Uh, a bike friendly community. You know, I had been in Boulder and had easy access to getting out to, you know, quiet country roads where I could, uh, you know, ride for miles and train. And I, I, you know, landed in Honolulu and, and I thought, oh, great, you know, summertime all year round, I'm going to be able to train. And I just, I freaked out, you know, honestly, I sold my bike, I withdrew from the race and I immersed myself in the ocean. I, I, you know, bought a couple surfboards. I joined uh, the Hui Lalu uh, paddling uh, uh, club, a canoe uh, paddling club out uh, in the Hawaii Kai area. Uh, I lived out that way. And yeah, it, it's, it was that dark and that dramatic for me that the, 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 the streets were just that hostile. And so it really shocked my system. But at the same time, I have to, you know, credit Honolulu and, and Hawaii for that because it really shook me awake and and made me think more deeply about the built environment, how our communities are actually designed, and how that impacts healthy, active living for all of us. Yeah, I mean, you know, my my story echoes yours very very closely. I I, I too arrived here with with my bike and super excited. And within the first two years, I I, I just sold it and and. I too traded traded my bike in for surfboards and kayaks because it just seemed safer to be out there in the water amongst the waves and and the the you know marine life than it would be to try and you know share the road with with a rather hostile uh, driving environment and you know I I went to school in Southern Virginia and and you know cycling there on the back roads. You think of some of the, you know, the worst things that people have to say about, you know, rural drivers and, and riding. And I felt way more uncomfortable um, here in, in Honolulu and you know, 
these examples here of the city, but on our rural roads too. It's it's a it's a it's can be a scary place. But you know that that I, many people saw that, and this is kind of where we we started this movement with the passage of the the 2012 Complete Streets Ordinance, and you know even more recently the update of our our bike plan and the and the very first pedestrian plan for for reasons such as this. You know the the island has hundreds and hundreds of miles of missing sidewalks. And at least in the example shown here, there's a there's a curb with some level of separation because too often places there 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 aren't those curbs. And and so the car is parked all over what what we call the unimproved sidewalk, where you know the reality is if, if you have any disability or or difficulty in 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 walking or or you know rolling you, you are left to navigate some pretty difficult circumstances. And this example here, this is a residential street, not, not two blocks from the beach. And, and the reality is you're, you're, you're taking your life somewhat in your hands with the hope that um, you know, the drivers are, are going to respect and see you. you know, a, lot of the, a lot of our cars and trucks with the more lifted you know, vantage points, we've all seen those images of, how many kids can be stacked in front of a, of a you know, lifted vehicle without being seen? And, and that is a big piece of this here is, you know, it, it's, it's not just the engineering. It's, it's really a, a broader education um, and, and really an encouragement. Advocacy, I, I, I think, is extremely important to, to help continue the conversation to ensure our elected representatives are getting the full picture and, and things aren't being driven by, by a, you know, the, the minority that, that really values car storage above all else. And, and that's, that's something that we, we've been trying to overcome for some time and, and we still have some work to do. I want to linger on this photo just a little bit because it really relates even to my my current neighborhood where I'm at now here in Boston, Texas. Um, You know, it was platted in the 1930s, built out, you know, in the 1940s. Uh, we, we don't have any sidewalks in our neighborhood. And so this is our reality is we are occupying the street space whenever we walk, whenever we bike in the neighborhood. The good news is, is that there's a culture of people walking and biking and walking their dogs and and kids riding to school and, you know, people in in mobility devices and wheelchairs, you know, rolling down the street. And so there's a culture of, you know, those of us who also drive in our neighborhood, we also know to slow down and be very, very conscientious of, of that. And I will say that post pandemic it's even better because during the lockdown during the pandemic it the number of people out on our streets uh, walking and biking and rolling and strolling increased by tenfold and and those levels stayed up and it is really helped with that culture of driving of slowing down occasionally we get people who are a bit too aggressive in our environment maybe they don't know the the neighborhood or whatever maybe they're visiting maybe they're working maybe they're cutting through and it's a little bit of a stark reality because sometimes you know i'll take photos walking down the street and I'll be, there'll be like 10 people you know, strewn across the street, walking in different directions, et cetera, and maybe one car trying to make their way through. Talk a little bit about that culture of who the streets are for in a neighborhood like this. Yeah, you know, that's a, you make a really interesting point. This community here was, was you know, platted and built out late 40s, early 50s. Um, and you know, the, the, the funny context of this, if you took the cross section of the road and, and looked at it with, you know, out of this angle, it, it would resemble not too many um, new urbanist designs that, that you know, are, are really lifted up as, as being walkable, livable places to live and, and do a great job. I mean, I've, I've, I've done work with, with Peter Calthorpe and, and, and some others who have done developments here in Hawaii that propose this type of work. The, the, the reality is, is that without the full ingraining of the culture, um, the people who are in the cars to both understand, but respect and, and prioritize the, the vulnerable users on the street. Not too far from here, there's, there's a couple of speed humps um, in succession, but 
they only do so much when cars are speeding in between them. It's unfortunate that it has not had a, a, a broader impact. And, and, you know, the result is that, that speeding is, is the predominant cause of, of our roadway fatalities. And, and we've seen that worsen since the pandemic. While I do agree with you that we, I see more people on the street biking, walking, whether it's for commuting or, or just recreational, because, you know, we do have more people working from home. And so uh, our, our peaks and our commuter traffic has changed quite a bit. However, speeding seems to have actually gotten a bit worse. And, and that's statewide. But, you know, we, we've uh, over time, we've had some some really, you know, great leaders come over and, and really instill some of their energy and knowledge to help help with that paradigm shift that, that I, that I spoke to this, this example here is, is Mark Fenton and, and he's been coming to Hawaii for, for a little over a decade now. And this is with uh, an AARP group. We were doing a, a, a walk audit of, of uh, Ala Moana area where, you know, future light rail station will, will be going hopefully sometime in the next you know five to 10 years, depending on, on how those political winds go. But, you know, that has been a big piece of, of where we are to get to where we are now, but also how I see us uh, moving forward. We are an island uh, state, and and thus, if we're not learning from each other, um, it's a long way to get some of that that type of impact. So we, we have been bringing over, you know, national uh, representatives for, for years now. Dan Burden, I, I, I believe, should be credited for for some of the, the work and projects we see being implemented today. 25 years ago, Dan came over. Uh, funny enough, my, my boss, uh, Cheryl Soon, um, who brought me here from Chicago she, when she was at the city. She brought Dan over to do some mobile walking tours and to show what was possible from a traffic calming standpoint. Dan's been coming back ever since, always with different hats on be it blue zones or livable communities. And really what Dan has been able to, to help with is, is really the conversation outside of, of just what the engineering piece of it looks like. Thinking through what a livable community could do for those that maybe don't think about it on a daily basis. You know, I, you and I, John, you know, we probably think about this in almost everything we do. And, you know, even when I go on vacation, uh, I'd like to say that, uh, my wife says that I have more photos of bikers and roundabouts than I do of my kids. But realistically, I, I see my kids every day and bikers and roundabouts, unfortunately, I don't see enough of, in, in my opinion. And so, um, you know, these are these things where, you know, the, the local context, if you don't see it around you, then it's a, it's a lot harder to, to understand. And so I, I live in a community that does have more more people out on foot and on bike and and it is respected, but you know, I, I, I get on my bike and five miles out of the town that I live in, and it is another world. It is a completely different world where, um, you know, the, the you know respect for users of the road really does change, and so it does take that that one percent to to be able to uh, navigate roads like that because it takes a little bit of uh, either craziness or guts to 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 be able to make that happen because. It, most people just would not put up with with that type of environment, and that points towards you know what you and I you know mentioned that that idea of seeing this and and saying I'm not even going to try it, selling our bikes, but we're, we're making small gains. It's just you know there, there's a lot of work to do. The, the city and county it includes the entirety of the island of Oahu, and so you go from a very dense downtown Honolulu to some of the most rural parts of the North Shore where you. You know, we currently are having, you know, huge big wave swells and, you know, homes being threatened by those swells as well. But, you know, singular arterial roads, you know, belt road system, former former plantation rail lines, there's not too much to the transportation network. And so that's a lot of people trying to share a very, very small amount of space. And so, you know, the, the ability to get around in anything but car um, outside of Honolulu, the city can be can be rather challenging. Yeah, yeah. Now you mentioned roundabouts. Uh, we both have a love for roundabouts. Uh, uh, this is on on the island of Kauai. 
And, uh, and this is what I would, you know, consider a, a fairly well designed low speed uh, roundabout, you know, one lane in each direction, um, probably a design speed right around 15 miles per hour, which in my mind is exactly appropriate. We, we do want to see design speeds around 15 miles per hour. Why? Because those are less lethal speeds, uh, you know, when we're looking at that. So when you look at the, uh, the people who are walking, uh, you know, meeting to cross here, you see that this is a very pedestrian friendly sort of environment for them. Talk a little bit about the, the, the state of Hawaii and how they're starting to embrace uh, more roundabouts uh, and, and, and hopefully a design that is a little bit more friendly to people walking and biking. I can't say that I have ever heard of a, a Dutch style roundabout being uh, put in where there's prioritization for people walking and biking, but maybe in the future, who knows? Yeah, you know, they say the sun sets last in Hawaii, and, and sometimes some of these more progressive ideas are a little bit late to 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 be implemented here, and, and there's pros and cons of that. It, it, it takes it takes Hawaii people a little bit longer to get comfortable with with some of these changes. But uh, roundabouts have uh, I am a huge uh, fan of roundabouts, and I do think that they solve a lot of the problems that that we have on our roads today. This one here. On, on Kauai in, in downtown Lihue was a part of a, a Tiger grant that, that the county of Kauai had, had won. And it really looked at reconfiguring the, the entirety of this street. It was a street called Hardy Street, which passed by their civic center and the, and the uh, foreground here. You can also, there was the, a school and a library. So it brought a lot of pieces that, that could and should be um, connectable by bike and, and by foot to an island that is much more rural and, and much less populated to show what is possible and, and to see what the context could look like. And, you know, if, if you go back about 10 years, that our state DOT had a memo on the books that said roundabouts were, were not priority and it actually restricted the consideration of any multi-lane roundabout with, with the statement that if in the future the potential for that intersection to uh, need to accommodate um, the amount of a capacity that would necessitate a multi-lane roundabout, then then it could not be considered. And so that was a huge obstacle in getting getting beyond. And, and just recently, and I'd say in the past five years, we've had a, had a, a some of that paradigm shift shift really has come to to fruition. And and we have roundabouts being being constructed on almost every one of the major islands right now. And we had our first multi-lane roundabout constructed on a, a state facility in, in Kihei, Maui. Um, I you know, have multiple roundabouts and projects that I'm both doing in planning, design, and, and overseeing construction. And while we're, we don't have a full Dutch roundabout, as, as you note, I, I actually um, am overseeing the construction of, of, a, of a roundabout uh, that has speed tables upon all entries and a, a off-street shared use path alongside it. And so um, it, it pulled from some of those those Dutch ideas. And, you know, in the, in the design, we, we have red pavers to kind of reflect that Dutch mentality. I know Austin has done a lot with red to to identify bikeways and, and, and really to provide that prioritization. And so, you know, we, we have these these small wins. This This example here, was was really done and and you know thought of by the the residential developer. It was a it was a development in the hills of Kihei, and and that developer decided that, that a two way cycle track was appropriate here. And you know what's funny is if I if I turned around from where this photo was taken, that cycle track just ends, and it's a big undeveloped hillside. And you know we have a lot of developable space, and we have a huge housing shortage here, and so. As we work with developers and, and try to integrate what it is they're doing, you know, getting some of these these small wins, even if it is a cycle track to nowhere right now, the getting that stuff on the ground is is a, a really big help and first step in, in making those connections. Because if you if you are a family that moves into here and you see that in front of you, you are now already thinking about what's possible from there. And so as you head to the bottom of the hill, where things become more dense and traffic becomes heavier and you lose that cycle track and protection and it becomes a shared shoulder, 
you know, that that itself might be be an opportunity for a future advocate, you know, someone who sees what is possible. And so, you know, I, I have to applaud the the developers that are that are doing things right from the beginning because you know it's that much easier to to build appropriately from the beginning than than what the majority of my work is, and that's towards retrofitting. You know, we have we have a lot of large roads out there, and and so um, not just from a, a bicycling standpoint, but but from a pedestrian uh, connectivity and safety. You know, trying to get some some improvements so that pedestrians can cross the street more safely to to play towards that that high level of you know pedestrian deaths per per capita. You know, we need to we need to work to to prioritize. And so, you know, these these cycle tracks and these pedestrian projects are are a big step towards that. But you know, roundabouts uh, you know uh, are an important piece in my opinion to just help bring the speeds down. You know, if we could really control vehicular speeds and, and force the prioritization of pedestrians and, and people on bikes, uh, you know, that's a big step. That's a big step th- towards, you know, making that uh, appreciation across the state. And if you build more of these, then you're setting yourself up for that opportunity to do a Dutch style roundabout situation, because that's, that's really the key thing of the Dutch style roundabout is the fact that you have these intersections inter- intersecting with the, the, the cycle tracks and being able to uh, then, you know, create that low speed environment, as you just mentioned, reinforcing the fact that these need to be narrow travel lanes, bringing the speeds down, the, the roundabout does a really, really good job. You know, a roundabout for the most part is motor vehicle infrastructure. <laughs> you know, it, it, it for the most part, that that's what it is. It's just a much, much safer form of motor vehicle infrastructure until you overlay, you know, the, the bike and ped facilities and then make sure that the design is such that gives that prioritization to people walking and biking and in wheelchairs and on scooters. Uh, then, then you are, you know, getting into a situation where uh, you're able to prioritize a low-speed environment and, at the same time, a very, very efficient, efficient mode of moving traffic through. But at the same time, encouraging a safer, uh, active mobility environment, which uh, I was delighted to see this particular facility in. It reminds me a lot of the Miller uh, neighborhood. You may have had a chance to. Uh, to visit that and all of the two-way cycle tracks that permeate throughout that entire development. So absolutely, and and really, I, I see the opportunity here to to mimic and 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 you know copy a lot of these great ideas you know that that are being done elsewhere, and that's you know a big part of of what I try to do with my work is is pull from what I see that, that appears to be working, um, and, you know, our, our collaboration with, with organizations such as, such as uh, NACTO have, have been, have helped us. And, and you know, this was a, the, the first protected bike lanes in, in, in the state. And they were put in in Honolulu along King Street. It started as a uh, one-way cycle track um, and then was ultimately uh, transitioned to the, the two-way configuration you see out there now. And you know, and alongside that, you'll still see five lanes of one-way traffic. And so, you know, we have a lot of work to do to really make that, that larger transition. But, you know, one of the benefits of, of having this, this King Street protected bikeway is, is that it, it goes from, from the east to the west along a, a large portion of our, our, our denser neighborhoods. And so it carries about a thousand cyclists a day. Which is a start, and and you know it, it's a start that I don't see us really building on until we until we can connect some of these and, and really take what is the spine here and and move into the communities and provide those those safe access points so that uh, you know into the mountains towards the ocean we can really start bringing people to these more protected facilities and and you know that that plays off of uh, some ideas and and plans about providing a, a protected bike network um, with, with, you know, separation of, of these bikeways by, by a quarter to a half mile. And so, you know, right now the, the city has been moving in that direction of, of implementing these as best they can, whether a part of re, repaving programs, temporary implementations, pilot programs like this, which are you know, now going on almost 10 years. And frankly, it still somewhat looks like this 
which says it's, it's going to be up for reconstruction in, in the near future. And, and the hope is that when we make those next steps, that we can start moving into the more permanent infrastructure that, that really brings the, the big levels of safety, you know, adding the, the protected crossings, making, you know, providing that buffer in a more, more physical means, uh, you know, and, and even, you know, narrowing down some of what, what it is we're, we're still providing for the vehicle. So we can slowly start transitioning people um, towards a more appreciative and, and um, accepting alternative to, to vehicle, private vehicle transportation. Yeah. You, you just mentioned with that particular installation, the, the use of some of the, uh, the the lighter, quicker, cheaper, quick build um, types of, of materials. Uh, that brings me to this next uh, photo, which I had made me smile because, again, using lighter, quicker, cheaper materials, getting some paint on the road, redefining what the space looks like, trying to bring the motor vehicle speeds down. Yeah, and this, this example is, is, a, is a project that, that we worked on um, just towards the end of the pandemic. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a quick build community collaborative project. And, and one of the most unique pieces about it was it was in a Hawaiian homelands community. And it was the first quick build project we had done in a homelands community. The, the interesting parts of, of that are that, that the, the roads and the lands are, are owned by by that entity, and so the state and county don't have jurisdiction over them. But you know, as, as I mentioned, it, it was our, it's our indigenous population that really has has suffered the, the worst um, as it relates to traffic fatalities. And so the opportunity to to work with these communities and, and this project here was building upon a safe routes to school plan that they had done a couple of years before. And you know, this this example here is a local artist from the community that, that came in and, and worked with the students at the adjacent school to, to really do these painted bulb outs. Uh, and it was done on four different corners around what is you know, we call the pico. And in Hawaiian, pico means center. Uh, it's also another word for, for belly button. It was the center of the community. And this 100-year-old uh, homelands community with all the bones and all of the, the network possible for it to be a great bikeable and walkable community, despite not having sidewalks. Um, what we did with this was we, we, we moved parking out within space that had been really taken away. And you can see those plastic parking stops there. Those, those circle the entire um, little bit over half a mile center of the community where this, there's three schools in a community park. And so we, we created a, a delineator and, and parking stop protected path around the circumference of the school. And so everyone traveling to from school, sporting games on the weekends, and, and even just community gatherings, they have this opportunity now to, to bike and walk um, within this protected space, which, which didn't exist previously. And when we think about a rural community, and this is a, a rather rural community, you know, still providing those opportunities um, within within the right context, and that's that's a big piece of this movement. You know, showing people that complete streets doesn't mean the same thing everywhere. It doesn't all have to be green bike lanes or 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 flashy bike signals that that you know may may not be uh, accepted or or appreciated from someone who considers the context of where they live more rural and and want to see that appreciated in in the road work, but but still need those types of uh, facilities that, that enable uh, you know, safe, safe walking, biking, and alternatives to, to vehicle travel. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to pop on over to uh, my hometown. <laughs> when, I, when I was living there, I was living uh, up in Waimea, um, uh, also known as Camuela, uh, on the Big Island. And you had mentioned like the ownership and responsibility of the roads. And it's one of the interesting things about the state of Hawaii is that uh, most of these little villages don't really have control over their roads. Most of their roads are either, uh, they're controlled either by, you know, unless you're right in Honolulu, most of these villages, the roads are the responsibility of the county, and then some of the roads are considered state highways. And there's challenges there because you kind of alluded to it earlier. Uh, you know, it seemed to me when I lived there for the decade that I was there, that it seemed to me like the traffic engineers that were in charge 
at the state level and at the, the county level seem to be still stuck in the 1950s and <laughs> feeling like it's all about moving cars. And so this is an example. I've, I've run and, and, and ridden my bike on this road countless times. And, and these are some incremental changes to this particular road because of the high crash rates and the high fatality rates along this stretch of road. Yeah, and, and you know, Waimea is a beautiful place. It is picturesque, you know, Hawaii Island. But, you know, one of the things that, that I love to showcase here is, is some of the creative ways that, that the county has, has really taken the, the initiative to, to make some of these changes. And, and the county of Hawaii, for, for a long time, has been doing a lot with a little. Um, these ideas of, of using zigzag crossings to slow people down, you know, in the prior photo with the pedestrian hybrid beacon, that was the first one used in the state. And that was connecting a, a school, a, a private school, the Hawaii Pacific, or, uh, across from what was a Long's Drugs. And so students were crossing what is otherwise a state arterial here, connecting, you know, two big harbors. And so the, you don't see it in the photos, but heavy vehicle and truck traffic travel along these roads. And and being the fact that, you know, everything we get has to come in uh, off a barge, there, there are a lot of commercial vehicle movements. In, in a perfect world, we'd, we'd provide some, some duplicated parallel facilities. And actually, out here, we, we've historically sought to get a bypass around the town so that the, the town itself can better own and, and honor these streets that go through the town and, and take that truck heavy throughput traffic and put it elsewhere. You know, however, the, the complicated thing about, about building in Hawaii is, is both in land ownership and, and you know, complications. It's, it's very expensive and difficult to, to build, uh, especially on Hawaii Island. And some of the examples that, that looked at, at routing a bypass around this town, everyone was met by, by an environmental obstacle that really couldn't be overcome. And so, when you think of, of regulations trying to ensure that, that we are doing things right, that too adds uh, to one of the restraints we, we have from being able to build alternative facilities. And so doing, doing more with what we have is, is largely the, <laughs> the marching orders we, we have here. We actually have a project right now in Waimea that is with the state and is both building a new roundabout in, in addition to off street protected bikeways and, and along the along Kauai High Road for, for about a mile and a half. And this was a project that came out of our work that started as the bypass road. The bypass road was really wanted by the community to increase the level of safety for, for biking, walking, and drivers in the downtown. But they wanted to see these changes in in a more rural context. And so pointing to Two examples here. This is Wailua on, on uh, the north shore of Oahu in, in you know, County of Honolulu. These ideas of, of seeing what biking and walking can be in a, in a rural context. This, this just happens to be my, one of my sons out uh, biking. Uh, we, we love to visit the north shore because of these side paths and, and protected bikeways. And, you know, the ability to have these safe, this type of safe infrastructure alongside what is otherwise rural traffic, you know, that's that's some of the the additional challenges in, in working with communities that span everything from the more urbanized downtown Honolulu to a more rural uh, Wailua or or Waimea. It's it's the context of these types of uh, applications while still ensuring that people have alternatives to to vehicle travel because. Just because they are living in, in a more rural community, just because they are driving a, a truck for work or, or pleasure does not mean that they don't have a desire for, for a more active town and community. They, they have kids that they would rather walk to school or, or allow them to bike to school. But, you know, the, the refrain that we hear too much is, I just don't feel safe. It's that cartoon that, you know, I didn't feel safe having Johnny walk to school, so I drove them. And, and realistically, you are you are then part of the problem, and, and unfortunately, th that is that paradigm shift that that we need to help to to make these greater movements. We we need to understand that there are alternatives. And until we start prioritizing 
our most vulnerable users are our, our, our kids, our elderly people on foot, people on bikes, and reduced vehicle speeds. We're, we're not going to achieve that those those greater goals because if you and I feel uncomfortable riding on on our roads or or getting around after decades of, of experience riding in, in hostile environments, then how can we expect someone who's new to riding, someone on a on a cruiser bike, my kids, my 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 wife, my in-laws, you know, how do I expect to, to convince them to walk our bike if I myself don't feel comfortable doing it? Yeah, yeah. Now, earlier you sort of alluded to the fact that uh, when you go on vacation, when you travel, your your wife is teasing you because you're always snapping photos and everything. So I, I, I don't remember. I, I'm, I'm not sure when you were in Japan, were, were, were you guys traveling? Was this a, a vacation? It was. It was our it was our uh, big post COVID. We, we had <laughs> had not gotten to travel, which which my wife and I love to do. We had not gotten to travel in, in three years. And so. We took this opportunity to, to go with our family of five. I have uh, three smaller kids, and, and we traveled for about three weeks um, throughout Japan. We started in Tokyo, um, stopped through Kyoto. This is uh, Osaka um, and, and some of the other small, smaller, more, more rural communities. And you know, this example here from Osaka you know, was, was really quintessential of, of what I saw there and was just blown away by the commonality of biking there. It just was not a big thing. And, you know, these examples of some of the, the shared, um, more traffic calm streets, I, I got the understanding that these are more recent changes in, in Japan. But, you know, even prior to this, Osaka has a 25% commuter bike share. And that that is on par with some of the, the highest percentage commuter trips in the U.S. and, and is, is not too far from, from some of the, the more, uh, uh, you know, high, high aspiring places in the Netherlands and, and elsewhere that, that are doing things on a great scale. Um, I had understood that, that Jan Gale had done some work here in Osaka and some of the, the treatments and, and stuff that, that I saw on these roads was it, it could have been out of, of anywhere in Europe and really amazing shared traffic calm streets. They were beautiful, but just outside of this, just at the end of this street was a 10 lane arterial. And I saw just as many people biking there. And that's, that's that 25% of, you know, bike share. That's, it's a really, it's a really impressive percentage. And, you know, those, those people on bikes were, it was a cross of, of half riding on the sidewalks, wide sidewalks, you know, often, you know, 12 to 15 feet wide on the, on the arterial roads, but a fair amount of them just, just sharing the road with other traffic. And, you know, the, the cars in Japan are, are a lot smaller than they are uh, here in the U.S., but that didn't overcome the fact that it, it still seemed rather treacherous to me. And, you know, in, in talking with with people that, that have both visited and worked in Japan and locals, I, I asked them, well, what is it? What is that? What is it that gets this this feeling of uh, safety or, or acceptance for use of bike? And, and the term that is used in Japan is gaman, G-A-M-A-N. And really, it's that it's that perseverance. And the, the Japanese people have, have that in, in spades. And it was amazing to just see uh, a, a mom on a bike with her kids riding, taking the lane in the center of, uh, of an arterial uh, travel way. And, and really, you know, people respected and, and drove around them. So that, that is that paradigm shift where it was, it was amazing to me that you could still have 10 lane roads, which I would never you know, point to as, as a good idea or something to aspire to, yet they were making it work. And so maybe there are different ways of doing this. But, you know, e even with all of what Japan had and the successes that they had, had garnered, um, they still acknowledge the need for more. And that's where you saw some of those impressive, you know, shared streets. And, and you can't see it here, but there's, there is a side path protected bikeway through the center of it. But there's such a high pedestrian population and high concentration of people in Japan, Tokyo in particular, that there's just a lot of people. And so managing people 
is quite quite an impressive feat. They have amazing train train transportation there that is incredibly efficient and fast and can get you anywhere you want to go throughout the country. That that combinations of of biking and walking and and walking and trains and biking and trains, which the Dutch you know point to all the time of that being that that perfect combination. It really it's it it shows in in Japan where. You know, you have 50, 50 to, to 60 percent, you know, people commuting by train. But but of those, 25 percent were taking their bikes to the train where, where, you know, the majority of others were walking. And so, you know, if biking wasn't the primary center uh, source of their transportation, it was a part of it. And so it really is ingrained in the cultures there. And, and I was so impressed by what they were doing. And and, and just as a, as a society, pieces of it that, that we could really start to copy and, and bring over because the, the Japanese influence on Hawaii um, historically, but even currently in, in, our, in our tourism and, and our visitors, it's a very close connection. So this is that idea of it, it, this is, should not be such a paradigm change. We can see it elsewhere in places that, that we visit and, and we have visitors from. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm lingering on this photo uh, simply because it brings back memories of when I was there uh, in Hiroshima and uh, and and basically echoing what you were saying is that people would ride their bike to the train station and there were literally hundreds of bikes parked at the train station. Get on the on the train, go into into Hiroshima, get off. And many of them had a second bike parked there and they get on their bike and they would go but then the the side streets the sidewalks looked like this really ultra wide sidewalks and uh and this this ballet this human ballet that you would see between the pedestrians the people on bikes and they're everybody's going any which way and it really i think exemplified for me how magical it is when we are traveling closer to human speed is that we're able to make all these little micro adjustments and you're able to actually move efficiently, you know, thousands of people through a space where if you tried to like put everybody into into cars, individual cars, or maybe even doubling them up, or maybe even having four people in a car, you still have gridlock. You simply can't move as many people as you can when you're traveling closer to human speed, walking or biking slowly. And that's why I love this photo so much is we've got this gal, she's on her bike, she's able to navigate quite slowly through this environment of pedestrians. And, and I see this all the time uh, in the Netherlands as well, is when, when we do see the mixing of modes and when we have shared spaces, you know, at slow cycling speeds, you know, you just bring that down and you're able to make eye contact and little little movements and uh, and really body language, too. Uh, and we we can actually move thousands and thousands more people than we could if we all tried to put them in into individual uh, hermetically sealed metal boxes. Well, it's just not possible in, in, a, in a country of, of size and population, but but even so, there, there are so many parts of, of what they're doing in the Netherlands and Japan through those, those mixes of, of just shared use that, that we can duplicate in, in, in so many other ways in, in what we do. And, you know, Japan had, had did, done a lot uh, with their transportation uh, network, you know, building out the train system that, that supports those, those greater distances of travel. And they just built things in scale. I wish I had a person standing next to this, but this was the cutest little fire engine I've ever seen. And it pulled out into what was a big shared plaza, one that is just packed with people at nighttime because it is, is rather hot there during the day in, in the summer. But, you know, building things to scale in a more human sized scale. And, you know, what I also didn't see a lot of in Japan is, is spandex clad, clad cyclists on on carbon frame bikes and and i'm not gonna lie that's me on the weekends because that's what's needed to still navigate many of our roads what you saw were were slow traveling cruiser bikes 
um, women in dresses, elderly, kids off by themselves. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen those photos of, of, of Japanese children traveling by themselves on trains. I saw it all over. It, it, it's amazing. And I'd like to hope that, that I would, would you know, do that with my own children, should I live in that type of environment. But you know, that's, that's the, a bigger paradigm shift that we really need to, you know, on a, on a national scale to, to make those changes. Because uh, unless we're out there doing it ourselves, how can we, how can we point to, to what's possible and, and what's comfortable and, and supportive? So yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's really impressive. Good stuff. Good stuff. To close us out, you've had this opportunity to, to you know, travel this year, uh, you know, to Japan. You've had the opportunity to, to you know, travel here to, to, uh, to Austin recently. When you get back home, when you get back to the islands and you look at the challenges and in, in, in facing you and, and you see that, yes, they're they're making progress slowly in their own sort of Hawaiian way. <laughs> but what are you jazzed about? What are you what are you excited about from this travel and and that you bring back home there and and hope you know that they kind of will, will resonate with so that we can continue to keep that momentum and maybe even accelerate the momentum because quite honestly there should be a sense of urgency for Hawaii. Climate change, you know, global warming is is devastating. I mean, we saw the horrific events happening in Lahaina uh, there in Maui. We were just we were showing some images from Kihei just up the road from Lahaina. You know, it, the the level of vulnerability that the state has, the islands have is is extreme. Do you get the sense, you know, what gives you hope that that, you know, some of these messages, these learnings that you're seeing from from traveling uh, will resonate with uh, with your 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 homeland, your your adopted homeland there? Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely my, my adopted homeland. And, and I am always coming back from from travel uh, energized to apply some of what I have seen and, and gotten to experience to 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 my lived experience and work here in Hawaii and. And, you know, one of the biggest reasons I take these photos is to be able to show others that, that didn't have that opportunity to travel to where I was, you know, what, what other people and, and other, other uh, cultures are doing. And, and that's trying to expand us beyond looking at, 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 a, at a Copenhagen or an Amsterdam or even a Portland where, you know, individuals may not be able to see themselves in those photos, um, you know. It's hard to, to suggest that that Honolulu is, is ever going to be a New York City or a Tokyo. But you know what we can do? We, we can do aspects of, of what we see here in Portland. And, you know, I, I really see and take a lot of these examples that I see when I when I travel and, and do my best to try and help apply them on a project by project basis, but also just putting them out there. To, to my, uh, you know, my, my friends and peers at the counties and states, so they have that in their toolbox as well. I mean, you, you, you mentioned some of the, some of the challenges that, that Hawaii is, is facing right here, right now, but uh, furthermore, as we get into the future, and it wasn't but a couple of years ago that, that a home on, on the North Shore of Oahu literally fell into the ocean, and, and that is a a active ongoing threat. And, and right now, as we're getting huge waves uh, uh, hitting our North Shores right now, that's, that's a threat that those homeowners face yearly. And, and it's something, and it's a big problem that has been staring us right in the face for a very long time. And I, and I have to admit, I don't, I don't think that we've been acting with the urgency that's needed. Um, and too often, the, the disassociation between our, our transportation priorities and, and really, you know, what it is we, we do to, to help move us towards a more sustainable and resilient community. You know, it, it takes us moving the, the needle on, on all levels. It's not going to be solved by, by solar panels and, and wind turbines, which we do need. And, and we are making leaps and bounds uh, in the energy sector, but, but we need to get beyond that. Our, our, our transportation uh, impacts to the environment are, are higher than most of any other sector we have there. So to disassociate how we choose to travel with the impacts of sea level rise and wildfires, that, you know, these are things that, that need to be acknowledged and, and the 
the connections need to be made. The, the horrific events of that just occurred in West Maui are, are, are very fresh in everyone's mind. And, you know, the, this idea of what the future of West Maui, Lahaina, and really the entirety of Hawaii, you know, wildfires are not new to Hawaii. They, they are just something that has never had s- such a severe impact as, as they did to, to the town of Lahaina. But those threats exist on every island across our state. At the time of those fires um, and devastation, there were ongoing fires on every island. And so we need to think towards this resiliency, emergency response, and how active transportation does play a role in it. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, as respectfully as, as I can do, I, I like to help move the conversations in the direction of understanding how you know, greenways can serve in the, you know, as a sort of emergency access. It can serve as fire breaks. It can serve as the redundancy that, that we don't have on a lot of our transportation networks due to the limitations both from a land ownership and, and environmental aspects. You know, there's a lot of complications to, to building the true redundancy that we need in some of these communities. And so, there are more straightforward ways to get there if we think uh, outside the box. And so, you know, my hope in, uh, as we move forward, it's going to be a long, a long process uh, for the people of Lahaina to, to build back um, their community. But, but I just hope that there's enough uh, foresight uh, during that process so that we can build a more resilient community and one that's, that's respectful of, of the people that, that were there and, and, and where the place comes from. You know, really going back to honoring the land and, and the people it is, a, is a common refrain, refrain across Hawaii and, and something that, that I, I believe believe it is important to, to the success and, and you know, future of, of our community. Yeah, yeah. Very well said. Mike, this has been an absolute joy and pleasure. Thank you so much for, for doing this. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you, John. It was, it was so great to see you, and I, and I can't wait to, to visit Austin again soon to, to be able to ride some of those uh, new bikeways and see some of those great projects um, going along in, in your, your hometown. And, and obviously, I, I would love to see you back out here again. We can go out there and explore some of the, some of the changes that, that we are making today. Hey, let's hey, let's make that happen. Yeah, I'm long overdue for a return trip. So yeah, I, I, I definitely need to make it home to my my adopted home there uh, for a decade uh, of uh, the, the state of Hawaii. And, and yeah, that's long overdue. So again, mahalo nui loa for uh, joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Mahalo, John. Aloha. Mahalo nui loa. Thank you so very much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, (laughs) leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts out on Patreon. Uh, My Patreon members actually do get access to all of this content early and ad-free, which is so great. So you can become one of the Active Towns ambassadors. Uh, You can also help support the effort uh, by buying things from the Active Town store. We've got some really cool water bottles and Streets Are For People t-shirts out there, uh, as well as making a donation to the nonprofit and even buying me a coffee through the Buy Me coffee program. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means a lot to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.